Welcome this afternoon to the uh, Yarra Dragon Health Forum. This is our obviously our May session, and it's with great pleasure that um, we look at the impact and feedback from families, how those families are impacted by drugs and drug use within those families, and the impressions those families have been left with in terms of help seeking and what works and what doesn't work and what they'd like to see more of and what they'd like to see less of. But before we do all that and get down to Tim Tax, it's with great respect and with great uh, pleasure and a little bit of sadness that I acknowledge that no matter where we're meeting today, we're meeting on Aboriginal land, which has been colonised, taken and stolen historically from the original inhabitants of this country. And I'd like to pay our deepest and my deepest respects to elders of the lands that we're meeting on, acknowledge them, acknowledge the almost 50, 60,000 year continuous history that those communities have had with this country and the countries we're on. And also recognise the emerging leadership of those lands and those communities and seek to acknowledge the great debt that we pay as occupants of this land to that culture and those cultures and to the enrichment of our lives by those cultures. We stand on the shoulders of giants, men and women from those cultures that have contributed so much and look forward to the day that we truly have peace, harmony and reconciliation with those communities in a deep and meaningful way. So our respect goes to all members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community that also might be in this meeting today as well. So thank you. My name's Peter Worm. I'm the chairperson of the Aerodrug and Health Forum. If you uh, had the uh, privilege of being here a little bit early, you would have seen uh, uh, one of our guest speakers um, who did a pre-record for our website. And you can see that pre-record, Chloe Stan, who's the uh, who's the Project Officer for Family Drug Support Australia. And Chloe's been in that role, I think, two or three years now. Is that right, Chloe? Yes. Yeah, two or three years. Chloe's also had a long history of uh, activism and advocacy in um, students for sensible drug policy. But more than that, Chloe's had a, a long-term commitment as a, as a human to a more humane approach to drugs and drug policy and enforcement issues and dealing with people with drug drug problems in a humane and human rights way. So it's uh, it's great to have Chloe along. We also have uh, Trish Patterson with us today, who's a mum and has a lived experience of uh, raising and dealing with a child that's uh, battled issues around drugs. And she's going to share from her rich experience of, uh, of being that mum and being that person. And also Horace Wamsborough, who's a youth and family worker who's had a long history working in, with youth from New South Wales through to Victoria, currently employed by WISAS and also working in, as, a, as, a, as a family worker and family therapist with uh, VACRO in the Victorian uh, prison system, women's prison up Tarangau, just outside of Bendigo. So welcome to all our presenters. And, of course, uh, my co-facilitator today is Mr Nick Wallace, who uh, none of this would be possible uh, without his technical and uh, much storied advice. So, again, my name's Peter Wern. I'm the chairperson, and uh, we hope today is going to be really informative in terms of helping people understand from the perspective of families what issues are for families around drug and drug... Uh, drug complexity within families, I suppose. I'm trying not to be pejorative. So like I said, our first speaker today is going to be Chloe Spann. Chloe is really um, uh, a, a dynamic worker with family drug support and I've uh, sat in training that Chloe's conducted and uh, I'm really wrapped that she could present today on the work that family drug support have done in surveying, surveying over 600 families across Australia about their attitudes and Chloe's going to present on those findings. So Chloe's going to speak, then we're going to have a small block of questions for Chloe that can either be in person or through the chat, chat function. And then we're going to go to Trish, who's going to talk about her lived experience as a parent and what she's learned. 
And then finally, we're going to have uh, with a couple of questions, then we're going to have Horace and a couple of questions, and then we're going to have a general discussion afterwards. So over to you, Chloe. Thanks, Peter. As Peter was saying, I'm Chloe. Um, I'm the Project Officer for Family Drug Support in Victoria and originally became involved in FDS doing volunteer training on their telephone line way back in 2015. So it's been a seven-year journey so far um, with, with FDS um, after stepping into the officer role about three years ago, I think it was, um, and it's a good organisation. Before we get into what we're here to talk about today, though, would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are meeting on, albeit virtually, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, for me, I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kaurna Nation and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded in Australia and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So we'd like to thank the Yarra Drug and Health Forum for inviting Trish and I to speak today. Um, we're lucky to have a family member give a personal account of what it's like to support, um, in this case, for Trish, it's her son, Joshua. So thank you to you. Um, as well as also talk about the findings from our national survey, which is really trying to understand the position that families take on where they want our policies to go in this space, which is an important topic. So we do welcome this opportunity because it's all too often that family perspectives on this issue are largely unspoken. Um, they're hidden behind closed doors and invisible in the community. Um, and we'd just like to alert people to one of the quotes from Tony in our media release um, which I think is just further down. Where are we here? Yeah, fantastic. I'm um, just coming up soon. Um, which put a bit of context around the survey findings when we first published them. And what he said was, it appears that everybody has a say on current drug policies, including politicians, police, religious leaders, media commentators. Yet families are all too often left out of these discussions, despite the people, along with those who use drugs themselves, of course, um, being most affected by current policies. So it's a very common um, for um, people who work in FDS and, of course, the families that attend our services um, to hear in support groups that families feel isolated scared and frightened. Not only do they have to contend with a lot of unforeseen circumstances that pop out out of the blue often when they least expect them, particularly when their family member is quite chaotic, but they also have to navigate disclosure of their situation in a community that's judgmental, that often blames the family and presumes that something must be wrong for something like this to happen. Um, as we know, drug use doesn't discriminate. It affects every single sector of our society from politicians to tradespeople to social workers to artists, much like family violence. Um, so it's very common in the feedback that we receive um, from people attending FDS um, that by being involved and listening to other families and gaining support from like-minded people, um, that they don't feel so alone which I suppose talks a lot to the loneliness um, that many people go through and also probably a lot of internalised values and beliefs that mightn't necessarily belong um, to any one person, um, which is very stigmatising and it, there's a lot of shame that's felt, um, typically adopted from the outside community. So we do really appreciate the chance to actually raise the voices of families um, today um, in that by continuing to have these conversations, we are reminding people that this is an important issue and keeping it in front of mind, um, hopefully and you know, bit by bit to make sure that we do have um, the important changes that we need to see um, 
really do improve the situations and um, people's life outcomes um, if the, for that for family members as well as people who use drugs and communities in general. Um, so that's really, really terrific. Now, when we are talking about the survey and um, what we've done this year for International FDS Day, which was an advocacy day that our organisation does every year, um, providing a, pl a platform for families' voices to be heard, um, we administered a five-minute online questionnaire for family members um, and anyone that's a member of FDS. And while the results didn't necessarily surprise us, um, they were very clear. And we can see that families want change. Um, they're impatient for change. They want a health-based response to their family members' substance use, not a justice intervention. Um, they want genuinely rehabilitative and compassionate approaches um, to see positive outcomes. And you can say, and I wouldn't be surprised, you know, what do you even mean by that, right? I mean, it sounds great, but what's tangible? And I think, um, like, for, for me, looking at the re results, what they present is some very workable solutions to some policy issues that we've got that are ongoing and that are problematic. Um, and you know, what we're seeing is an overwhelming amount of support for evidence-based harm reduction programs amongst exactly what Peter was saying. We had over 600 people um, respond to the survey. 64% of them were parents, so a mother and a father of someone that's got a drug dependency. So people who are arguably real experts on this issue, they deal with it every single day. It's you know, very intimate. And when you look at the figures on this slide, you know, there's only one there that's below 80% support. That's really significant. And we got that percentage from people who responded to sort of a Leichhardt question of agreed or strongly agreed with these initiatives. Um, and it means a few things, right? Because when we look at this, we can see that some of these harm reduction programs are, are already an, a fantastic thing that they are, um, widely implemented throughout the country. We've got pharmacotherapy. We've got needle and syringe programs, you know. However, we're also seeing 86% of the respondents wanting drug checking and pill testing, as well as injecting centres, as well as heroin prescription. And these policy responses typically are known to be much more controversial. Um, but in terms of um, family members who have the experience, that know what it's like, that understand what works, and our interpretation and sort of inference on these findings is that because people know the value of a drug checking service or they know what a difference it's made to have an injecting centre nearby, they understand that they are life-saving programs. So, again, it wasn't a surprise to see these results. Um, however, it's also very telling just the amount of support that we're seeing for these programs. Um, just quickly before we move on to the next topic, I um, would like to highlight just a quick comment on drug checking and pill testing because we uh, it's been in the media lately, hasn't it, um, particularly in respect to the Groove and the Move Festival that was meant to go ahead, um, I think it was last month um, in Canberra, and we've had a huge win actually nationally for, for drug checking and pill testing because the ACT has given the green light for a fixed site service to become established in Canberra, which is wonderful. I'm sure everybody else is quite aware that um, governments all around Australia, federal, state and territory governments um, typically have not endorsed this strategy um, and are being very reluctant to consider, um, to consider it as a viable policy option. Um, and while that's really, really terrific, um, I suppose some of the um, ongoing um, issues that we all have to sort of attend with is that we've had two really terrific um, pill testing pilots go ahead at Groove and the Move Festival and everyone, another one was well and truly lined up to go ahead except um, the insurance policy uh, and company pulled the pin at the last minute, I think days before the festival. So, you know, even though there are these fantastic steps forward, I think it is a it is a slow burn. You know, we talk a lot in FDS about things being 
a marathon and not a sprint. And I really believe that that's the same thing when it comes to these sorts of um, policy change processes. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> I think a lot of advocates interpreted that, um, you know, shutting down of the pill testing it this, this year um, as a bit of a setback. And, um, you know, obviously were these motivations about mitigating risks or not when it was right at the last minute. So there are still, you know, um, some things that we need to work through and overcome. But by, again, you know, having these sorts of presentations and talks, raising awareness about these sorts of things, are we much more likely to, to have better, better progress and better luck? Um, the other thing, of course, is that this is what we're hearing from um, the people who have responded um, to the survey in that, you know, they want, they want this help and that's one of the most important things that we're hearing and thank God that we can. So just moving on to one of the, the other findings about um, decriminalisation. So there was also a hell of a lot of support, I think 79% we saw in the sample um, that wanted some form of decriminalisation of currently illegal drugs. And if you look at that slide up there with the, um, I think you've, yes, fantastic, um, with all of those colourful little bars, you'll see the top one up there, cannabis, was very much supported. And interestingly, one of the second most strongly supported one was, was decrim of all drugs. Um, so all in all, I think only 21% of people who responded to the survey didn't weren't supportive of decrim at all, um, which is really, really significant um, in my mind. And when we talk about decrim, of course, um, we mean the um, removal of criminal punishments around um, possession charges. Um, so people who would still be doing sort of high level um, trafficking and distribution potentially involved in organised crime would remain in the justice system. But we're talking about removing any contact with um, getting a criminal record or um, the possibility of doing incarceration or any of these really sort of, you know, um, damaging outcomes from getting caught with drugs um, removed and a referral to um, a referral to AOD treatment or to um, counselling be made instead, and potentially a fine, so a civil a civil charge. Um, the significance of this, I think, for me, is that it's about families really rejecting a law enforcement approach to this. Um, I think it was something like treatment and health responses were favoured. Seven over one um, from police and courts. So you know, what we're hearing is that um, families are really, really interested in making sure that their loved one isn't necessarily receiving um, contact with the justice system or a punishment or becoming criminals. Now, <clears throat> we've also had a bit of a, a win in Victoria around decrim in one of the independent crossbenchers, Fiona Patton, who sits on the upper house in Victoria, introduced a bill um, for this exact policy um, option recently. And while the government didn't necessarily give it its full um, endorsement, it did allow a working group to set to be set up in Victoria, which is fantastic. And that's called the Infringement Trial Working Group. It's a committee on the matter. Um, so while you know we haven't got um, we haven't got that sort of hands down in this state, and if we did um, that would be a huge step forward in my mind um, for people who use drugs and their, and their families. Um, if you would like to show more support to that, I think Nick is going to be able to pop a link in the chat, which which means that you can um, send a letter to um, to the health minister around it, supporting it as well, if that's you. And if it isn't, that's absolutely fine. Um, but the option is there. And what we're seeing a bit kind of in the background um, with the decrim bill is that um, it was announced in March. There hasn't been much news about it since. And there are a few advocates who have been emailing the Attorney General and the Police Minister, Lisa Neville, asking what's been going on with it. So I think the more we can do um, to remind um, the government that this is something that the community wants um, is a good thing. 
So just on this, and I'm sort of coming towards the end pretty soon, um, and I'm not going to be able to get through all of the survey findings today. Um, if you're interested in um, having a look at more of them, I'd encourage you to go to the website, and I think I'll talk to that in a second. But um, interestingly, these findings um, are, are very, very similar to a biannual survey that Harm Reduction Victoria does, um, Harm Reduction Australia, my bad, um, does with its members, which is a national advocacy organisation. And their members consist largely of um, people who work in the sector, so it's more of an occupational lens. The data that we're seeing here is from people who live the situation every day. It's in their personal lives. It's in their family homes. Um, Harm Reduction Australia, that cohort of people who are very much part of this community are, uh, are workers, um, are researchers, are managers. And um, they also have a level of, um, you know, of knowledge about this, which matters. And comparing the responses um, in both of the surveys were almost like a mirror image. So what we're beginning to see is some evidence being built around um, people that have lived and living experience of this are saying one thing, people that live in and work in the community um, that have the occupational um, expertise are saying the same thing. And um, ultimately what that says um, to me and I think probably a lot of other people is, you know, the people who, who were affected by these particular policies, you know, know what they want. They've actually spoken and it's time now um, for politicians and for policymakers to begin um, to, to listen to these communities and understand that um, they might have something to learn um, from them and that this can make meaningful change. So I don't know if Harm Reduction Australia have actually released those findings yet, but they will be soon. And that might be a good thing for the Yarra Drug and Health Forum potentially to circulate amongst um, maybe on social media or something, um, just to get that information out there too. So it's interesting to see um, a lot of support being spoken about by different areas of the community, basically. But I think in general, what we know and what this speaks to is that punitive measures attempting to eradicate drugs from society, we know they don't work. A war on drugs is a war on people. And giving those that are struggling the opportunity to access universal health care if that be through a decriminalisation model, if that be through more extended harm reduction programs throughout um, throughout Australia, as well as a heroin assisted a heroin assisted trial, which would be terrific, um, these forms of basic support can go a long way to um, helping people who are, who are experiencing vulnerability in the community and deserve help. Um, so, if you would like to know more. Um, please check us out um, at internationalfdsday.org.au. Um, I think the, yeah. I'm Trish. Um, I'd like to tell you a bit about us and us being myself and my son. Um, I'm reading from my notes, so, yeah. I'm now 60 and my son, named Joshua, is now 37 years old. At the age of 15, he began dabbling in marijuana, but it took two years for me to know this. Joshua was always a sensitive child. Between the ages of five and eight, Joshua and his sisters were all victims of sexual abuse. His sisters, his sisters sought help over the years to deal with what happened, but Joshua began using drugs to dull the impact of the memories. That was something he told me himself. I understood what he meant, but I didn't like what it was doing to him or where I could see it was going. 
I'll pause for a moment here and just to make sure you understand, I don't for one moment mean that every person that has or is using drugs is using them to cope with with trauma, et cetera. However, this was our situation and the reasoning behind it initially was his. Along the way and either side of us going to court, Joshua used various different drugs in, on a continual basis to maintain the comfortably numb platforms he now chased. The seven years we spent making the perpetrator accountable saw him jailed. Our time in court was harrowing but essential. I hoped it made life somehow seem a little fairer to my three children. Around the age of 27 onwards, he would sometimes say he needed to get off what he was using, but it didn't last. He couldn't seem to push through without it. He'd ask if he could return home to make a new start, and of course I'd let him try. During the stints without using, he was horrendous to deal with. He'd begun to self-harm. He'd use a lighter held to his arms, slowly puncturing his abdomen with a screwdriver and use broken glass to cut his wrist area. Then one day I found him in the shed hanging himself on his weights machine. I dialed triple O and the paramedics got him down and hospitalised him. He would frequent psych wards, get arrested by police in our small regional town and continue to help self-harm, all the while maintaining his addiction. He had girlfriends, which was no doubt part of life. However, they just added another layer of fear for me. They were someone's daughter and they were with him when he lived dangerously without fear. I helped him and housed him to the best of my ability for many years. During this time, I lost friends and family members struggled to find anything good to say about our situation. Ignorant outsiders, outsiders suggested I just let him go. I felt I was becoming alienated because of what was happening and I absolutely couldn't turn our situation around. Service providers, counsellors and my GP were by now the only people who understood. There wasn't much help around in the regional areas to deal with what we were going through. For us to get help, it either required me to ring Triple O and get police to come, an ambulance if the results of his self-harm needed attention or I'd ring psych services to book an appointment with someone in the following week and they closed every day at 5pm, also closed all weekend, so no help to us. To get Joshua into psychiatric hospital 45 minutes away, we needed to be assessed first and that would take place at our local regional hospital. However, because his previous explosive episodes while waiting to be seen by someone in emergency were no longer allowed we were no longer allowed to enter. When I told our GP this, he immediately organised for him to be medicated prior to entering the hospital. I understood the reasoning behind the doctor's methods, but this, of course, in my eyes, completely dissolved any hope of him being able to explain what he was feeling or displaying or his displaying symptoms while in his normal everyday drug fueled ups and downs. The local police asked me on numerous occasions if I'd like to lay charges against my son, to which I declined. I knew if I did, he'd end up in jail, where there'd be no mental health or AOD support that he needed to maintain his demons. I thought if I'm going to lose him, I didn't want it to happen alone in a jail cell. I wanted him to know he was loved. He slash we went on like this for 13 or so years before he left to live 7.5 hours drive away in a small, quiet town and he met people like himself and battled on. I also moved away from the long-time goldfish bowl existence in a small regional town and began life in a bigger place. At 49 years of age, I re-educated myself in community services and disability while maintaining a strong interest in welfare, AOD and mental health. The GPs suggested counselling for Joshua, but rehashing his past sent his head spiralling downward and thus he leaned harder onto the illicit drugs. He was also on depression medication and antipsychotic medication and Valium if he got lucky. This is where I speak about the importance of decriminalisation of personal use. I can say I have watched my son obtain abstinence for four months, 18 months ago, it was nothing short of hell in my eyes. He fought the earnings that raised their ugly heads every afternoon and evening, 
His nerves were frightful to the point of being afraid to open the front door and face life. I asked him, what is it you're afraid of, Joshua? He'd say, everything, Mum. I'm afraid of everything. He'd cry like a five-year-old. This went on for months and memories would, his memories would return and there was now no buffer. After about five months, I asked how he was going because he seemed to be a bit calmer. He said, okay. I learned he was using marijuana once again to maintain his nerves. And I didn't mind at all. He told me how he asked his now GP for Valium to ease his extreme anxiety. And if he was lucky, he'd receive four, but was often reminded that he mustn't use them as an addict. He must use them with the view of not asking for them next time he came in. I, of all people, will admit I once wouldn't have understood the need for decriminalisation of personal use, but now I do. I really do. Total abstinence isn't for everybody. Roughly four years ago, in absolute desperation to find help for myself, I came across family drug support. I looked up support for parents and read there was a meeting supposedly being held each Wednesday night in town. I went to a 7pm meeting and gradually, after a couple of weeks, I could feel a slow release of my inner turmoil. FDS was a breath of fresh air to me because I was finally in the company of other parents who had a loved one using drugs. The facilitator let us all speak in a comfortable setting where there was no judgment or harsh opinions about the road we'd been on. FDS taught me I couldn't fix Joshua, but I could continue to love him from a few paces further back. This new boundary in which I learned to operate from became my own soul's saving grace, a place from which I could begin to finally look after myself. I also occasionally do FDS on call. It's a 24-7 service where people like me back in the day would ring to speak to someone as I would have done had it been available to me back then. Unbeknownst to the callers, it still sends shivers through my soul listening to the people in the same situation I was once in. I understand their despair and their loneliness as they try diligently to support their child who is still heavily involved. They're all desperately seeking constructive help. FDS has helped me put a spin on our hard times by aiming to help others through our lived experience. I can now slowly begin to reframe various parts of our journey to be reused as tools for those still seeking help. I'm not here to sell FDS to you. I'm here expressing the absolute importance of seeking help for yourself. Self-help comes in many forms. You'll know when you've found what you need because you'll feel a sense of inner relief. Your focus will realign and you'll begin to feel whole again. We need more accessible rehabs and detox. Mental health and AOD workers are needed 24-7 at hospital emergency regional hospitals too. More support for family members, group, one-on-one. -on -one. When loved ones are released from hospitals, psych wards or other service, service um, stopover, it makes sense that families be given some sort of details or update as to what to expect now. Open, honest conversations with a chosen, with a chosen or family members. Users follow up treatment plan. Crisis network numbers to ring. A list of self-help resourceful reach out places providing ongoing support for families as well as users. Ongoing updates in regard to follow-up appointments. Information around drug use for families so they can educate themselves around displaying symptoms, drug types, side effects, relapses, etc. Pardon me. I'd like to leave you with this thought. Every person you see affected by drugs was once somebody's beautiful newborn baby that grew into the child that absolutely didn't make a conscious choice to become so involved in drugs that it devours the best part of their lives, not to mention their family's lives. People that saw my son back in the day at his worst would often cast harsh judgment, but I knew the boy beneath and the circumstances. Remember, 
casting harsh judgment on a using person is like opening a book you've never read at page 356 and presuming to know what happened prior. The truth is you can't possibly know. You can only presume and guess, thus create your own version of events. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's uh, an absolute privilege to uh, hear what you had to say, Trish, and uh, total respect and uh, to you and to your son and your family for the journey that you guys have been on. I suppose I've got one question I'd ask both you and Chloe, Trish. Um, when you, when you uh, talk to families and being a family member, Trish, that's been dealing with this issue so intimately and personally, what do you think the most important thing families are asking for? What do, they, what do you think they want? when they're at that point where, where it's all just hitting them like a baseball bat? Well, um, I, as I said before, I now do FDS on call and that is people like myself in the day that are ringing up and I find they just want to blurt out what's going on without me having any judgment and absolutely I don't mm. and I know the importance of that that talk that they need to have I absolutely do because it was bottled up inside me for such a long time and I didn't know who to talk to so I used to write it down but it's not quite as good as being able to say it to someone yeah what about you Chloe um <clears throat> A few things came up for me when you asked that question, Peter, and um, I think this talks a lot to the point that was made a bit earlier about um, not feeling so alone, that being the number one piece of feedback that we have from people attending any of our programs is, you know, it's just such a relief um, to know that I'm not the only one going through this situation. Um, I think the other thing that comes up quite a lot is that um, everyone's on a different spot in their journey. Um, and, you know, these sorts of things aren't linear. They're often quite cyclical. And when you think you kind of have done all this, you know, fantastic work and are feeling heaps more in control and progressed and stuff, all of a sudden something will, you know, you all of a sudden are still feeling a lot of grief and still really afraid and these sorts of things. So um, a common a common thing that comes up is people want the answer. You know, they call because they want to know how do I fix the drug problem? <laughs> like... Um, and, of course, um, as a reality-based service, we're not there to sugarcoat things. Families are the experts and their own loved ones. We aren't there to provide the, you know, magic bullet or the solution or anything like that. Um, however, we are here as a consultation service and we walk alongside people for, for them to make the decisions that are right for them, and that's their choice. You know, they're in the best position to, you know, decide things. Um, Except I suppose the other thing is that for us, um, one of the most important um, focuses, I suppose, for many families is developing some trust again, developing um, a relationship with that person. There's so much, you know, people are so scared and frightened that it really interferes with the connection that they have with them. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the biggest things is really giving people in some ways a bit of permission for them to love their family member again. Mm. Um, and that's what our program Stepping Stones does. And um, we, we invite the person to go on that journey with us in the room by their bringing in a photo of the person. And we, we workshop that whole, um, you know, invitation by passing photos of, of the family member around the room and people are only allowed to say positive things about that person. And we just did a program in um, in March and the majority of the feedback from that was, wow, I actually realised that all I was focusing on was the drugs. You know, I, I now because of, you know, because of understanding things from a slightly different perspective, whatever, I actually understand that they're still, they're still that person um, and there's so much more warmth, so much more humanity there, a lot more acceptance, a lot more compassion. Um, and, and it doesn't stop. It doesn't fix the problem. The, there's still drug use involved. There's still chaos. There's still everything. 
accept, um, you know, it's people connecting in as people anymore. There, there isn't a, a hierarchy and that, that makes such a difference. Yeah. Thanks, Chloe. <laughs> Uh, Horace, in my mind, is a bit of a legend in the uh, AOD youth and family area. Um, he's He's got over two decades of work in this space. And uh, Horace works in regional Victoria, but he's worked in Metro Melbourne and uh, worked in regional New South Wales in these areas around young people, young people drugs, families, and uh, and more recently in the area of family therapy. So I'd like to uh, like to welcome Horace today and uh, encourage him to share his thinking around the things that we've been talking about and the work that he does. Cheers, Horace. Thank you, Peter. That was a really kind introduction. Um, are you hearing me? Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Uh, Peter's been quite quite a figure in my life. I remember um, doing some amazing street outreach, assertive street outreach shifts with Peter at 1am in the morning around Richmond and in the, in the city. And um, I've, I've learned a lot from Peter over the years. So thanks for inviting me today. Um, and congratulations to Family Drug Support too for that extraordinary uh, report with over 600 respondents. I think that's pretty bloody impressive. And um, I'm now feeling like I don't have heaps to offer after hearing Trish too. <laughs> Just nailed it in terms of like all the things that, that families talk to me about as a practitioner about what they need from the system. Um, and yeah, I, I might just continue in that, in that line of thought and uh, perhaps use this time to talk about what it is like in, in the service system as a practitioner when you're trying to bring in families, what's, what are some of those barriers? Uh, what does it kind of look like? What's the state of play at the moment? Um, and the caveat to all of this is that my primary uh, focus of the work that I do um, around AOD is young people. So I don't have a detailed knowledge of the adult drug and alcohol system. And some of the things that are happening there, such as um, family rehab, um, such as reunification programs and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's another part of the system that would be really interesting to to um, get some more info on in this kind of forum at some stage. But I'm I'm talking about young people um, who use substances uh, where it's the pointy end. So they're coming into treatment into a treatment service. Um, it's not recreational use. Uh, it's it's risky. It's dependent use. And, and there's some distress in the systems often, so often in the family systems particularly. Um, uh, as a sideline, I'd like to sort of try and make a bit of a connection with my other work. As, as Peter mentioned, I do work as a family counsellor at Tarangal Women's Prison. So it's almost like some of that lifespan kind of um, perspective of working with people who've had um, significant substance use and the interface with the justice system and, and often statutory services like child protection and child removal happening and people going into custody as, as parents and, and the impact that that creates with um, the loss of family connection and so forth. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a fair bit I'd like to say about that, but we won't have time, but <laughs> I'll throw in a few uh, observations if I may. So I've got some contact details, which I will post into the chat as well, because I, I really love talking to people about family inclusive practice in, in AOD services. And uh, people do call me and we have great chats. Um, so please, I, I really encourage that. Uh, what's happening? Why can't I? Okay. So why would we even do it? Well, we've got, we've got the um, family drug support uh, report, which is really endorsing um, a family inclusive pro approach. Families are crying out for it, but also, you know, if you're just going to take a sort of like a clinician clinician approach, <laughs> um, there are examples of uh, family work um, internationally, uh, not so much in Australia in terms of research, but certainly internationally, there's promising um, indications and hints um, that that family approaches could be very effective. Um, Something that keeps coming up, I think, 
for people who are family orientated is the open dialogue approach in northern Finland. Um, it's not an AOD intervention by any means. It's actually a mental health one. But the outcome of this approach has meant that they have closed down their inpatient units for adolescents in the whole northern part of that country. Completely closed them down. They don't have an inpatient acute ward for adolescents. And what they have done is, is train everyone up from the receptionist to the chief psychiatrist in, in being able to um, deliver family inclusive work. So they will go out to a home and if someone needs to be on suicide watch, they'll talk to the, you know, the sports coach, the prince, school principal, someone's brother, someone's uncle, uh, someone's sister, someone's mother. They bring them all together and have a facilitated discussion about how to create some safety in that home. Um, the caveat to that, I guess in my opinion, is if it takes a village to raise a young person and you don't have a village, um, we have probably a bit of a challenge to, to have a, a model like that taking off in Australia. But I think there's some very good principles there. Um, what tends to happen here for us is we're so spread out, so what you might get is a group of professionals who are paid <laughs> to be there, sitting around that person trying to create safety. And often the missing ingredient for that is, is families and the young person themselves. So um, there's, there's a lot of challenges for us here in this context. Um, some of the big name family therapies that, that um, you, you'll see around the place uh, are getting a bit of attention in the States. So um, I am... I've got a bit of a, yeah, trying to get rid of that. Uh, recently, a couple of years ago, actually, um, Associate Professor Bryce McLeod um, was brought over from the States to, uh, to visit Australia. He presented at Turning Point, and you can still see that um, lecture up on the Turning Point uh, Talking Point series. And um, he talked about some research they've been doing um, comparing family orientated approaches to really tricky. Uh, work with young people. And we're talking not clinical populations. We're talking young people in the justice system. And again, that pointy end of drug and alcohol use um, that tend not to make it into those kind of, <laughs> uh, into that research. Um, and the findings were that they actually outperform well-established cognitive behavioural therapies and motiv motiv motivational interviewing, which we're all really familiar with in, in AOD. They're our kind of bread and butter. Um, but these, I'll tell you how you can tell that it's valued in the States, is that family-orientated therapies attract the highest rebate for insurance payments when you access the health system. So if you have a young person who's hitting the justice system with all sorts of offending behaviours and AOD, they, they don't necessarily send you to a private psych psychologist to cognitive behavioural therapy, they will. They know that the best outcome that you'll get is a family oriented approach. And some of these um, big brands, if you like, of, of uh, family therapy sort of have a bit of traction in the States and are finding their way into Australia as well. Um, I probably don't have time to do a, a dive into some of these um, therapies, but one of them, um, the multi-dimensional uh, family therapy, uh, I've sort of been influenced. Uh, I've used it as an influence. I'm not following it by any means, but in any kind of manualized way. And I'll talk about why not. Um, but it gives permission in its framework. It sort of says, look, you can do individual work. You can do family work. You can do parent work. And you can do wider community and advocacy work, and it's all drug and alcohol treatment. So currently our model is it's individual work. That's what's really funded in, in the sector. Um, blatant self-promotion. Uh, there is a model at, at um, YSAS Bendigo that I am working on, which is an outreach model. It's just like a, a family um, specialist role. I was very lucky to have a manager, Kerry Donaldson, when I came on board and she said, write the job description. So I, I wrote up a, a family model, which has been evaluated. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, 
uh, asking youth workers whether they'd feel comfortable doing family work is a challenge. Many youth workers feel really comfortable with young people. That's what they've signed up for. They want to be able to engage and go down to the basketball courts and, you know, shoot some hoops or do some driving around in the car, having a chat or listening to music. That's where they're at home. Uh, they're not as at home when they're um, doing a, a visit and maybe doing a coordination meeting with, with parents and thinking about how do we create some safety in this house and then having to also think about are there other child welfare issues here? Are there more complexity and trauma that I can take on that I'm not trained for and skilled to handle? And so there's there's um, some doubts and barriers that, that come into play for, for youth workers. But I like this, uh, this quote here, if you've had time to read it while I'm chatting, is that... Um, a youth worker is saying it's not about our relationship with the young person, it's about their relationships and making a really interesting point about people in out-of-home care is that um, we need to be extra careful that we just don't take over from systems where they might be able to create really sustaining um, uh, attachments around them. It's, it's that old thing of, yeah, you're looking around the room in a care team and everyone's paid to be there and it's like this this... This picture is wrong. <laughs> um, recently, VADA has been putting on a sequence of uh, training for the AOD workforce. Uh, one of those I delivered uh, a week or two ago, which was around a, a, a possible framework for, for working with families. And one of the things that came out of that was that the, the people involved who were fantastic and really interested, engaged, and, and quite senior workers as well, were all saying, actually, just what does it look like? Yeah. Yeah, the framework looks really pretty, but what does it look like? What does the office look like when you've got a family inclusive space? Um, what what does the response look like from from the workforce? So um, I'm hoping to follow that up with with more of that. Certainly, um, in in my workplace, we've been thinking about things like: Do you have child friendly areas? Do you have some jumbo crayons on the floor with some paper? Do you have like a really big table where everyone can gather around and, and you can do some genogramming and eco mapping. Um, do you have a, a space that's okay, big enough to have a family or safe enough to have a family? Um, uh, and I guess other things that have come out is, is yeah, is the workforce skilled and confident enough, as I've mentioned? Um, young uh, Youth workers, maybe not sometimes, but but the appetite there is is really increasing for this work and, and people recognise that it's really where it's at. Um, we need organisations to support to support that work um, and endorse it. Um, and we absolutely need parents and caregivers to be involved with our service design and even governance. One of the things that really keeps coming back about the AOD sector is that how far behind we are compared to the disability and mental health sectors with family and carer inclusivity. So, I mean, for decades now, the mental health system and disability have had parents involved in all aspects, you know, of, of care planning, of, of discharge planning, like where is this young person going to go home to? What's it going to look like? What's the plan afterwards? Um, and, and still in AOD, we're only just starting in the last sort of year or two to have really um, uh, getting a foothold that, that the family Family work is, is really that um, could be the centre of our practice as well. Um, so, including families at all stages of treatment, you know, an assessment. Come on, bring you. families carry that whole story, the whole story of the trauma, the story of the um, school experience. Was the child bullied? Would did they have um, difficulty with learning? Do they have diagnosis that we don't know about that that uh, were left untreated, or perhaps we could help. Um, connect them into um, support for autism spectrum issues or or um, mental health issues that have been persistent over time that were unaddressed. Um, here's a sort of graphic. This is in development, but it's really just trying to um, capture the fact that family caregiver give a sensitive and inclusive practice could be the, the heart of our work, and that could include things like going to a community night 
you know, why wouldn't that be the heart of our work? Why wouldn't going to a, um, a Pacific Islander singing night with, with cultural experiences and seeing the young person that you're working with connect with their family and their culture, why wouldn't that be a really significant part of the work that you're doing with them um, rather than something that sort of sits to the side at the moment? Like where do we put that work? Don't know. Sort of doesn't really sit, doesn't um, ha have a, a sort of endorsement and a framework that, that, that kind of holds that. Um, so, yeah, one of the principles about a framework like this is that it, it um, recognises that families have rights to the information required to carry out a caring role and, and their own needs need to be acknowledged and addressed. Um, and, and looking at that, as I said before, that, that earlier developmental history is really important for us to understand that young person. Um, Another one which I like, I think, I think I might have had a not more self promotion. Oh my goodness, is <laughs> is, is uh, I think I had a role in, in some of the wording of this one, which was um, the practice involves um, working with the strengths of a family system and other important relationships to reduce risk, increase resources, and to mobilise and build networks of love and care. Um, that that's sort of going to the point of, I guess. Um, many things that Chloe and Trish really highlighted and, and also that the service system just isn't going to be there all the time. It's, it's often not there at 2am in the morning. But how can we support those families so they have um, the support that they do need at 2am in the morning? Is that getting respite from another family member? Is that having um, some on-call support? Is that what, what can that look like? Um, a few comments on what could would change in the in the service system. Um, so one is more community awareness and destigmatizing substance use, um, supporting families to enact harm reduction strategies. I mean, as a fa as a family orientated youth worker, I would never sort of say to a family, I would never give advice that look, it might be safer to monitor this use and allow it in the home and. I would never give advice that you would maybe source substances for that young person because they might be safer if you if you did it that way. But if if a family does that, uh, if they are doing those practices, I never I don't go enabling and using all that kind of language. <laughs> I just go, okay, how can we how can we really think about this? This is this is your expertise. You're wanting to keep everyone alive and safe and protected. Um, what, what would that take? How, how does that work in this environment? So I've highlighted this next point because I think this is, um, this is probably where some substantial change could happen. That statutory systems, and I'm talking about the justice systems and child protection systems, could really truly adopt harm reduction and a strength mo model and, and communicate better and coordinate better with community and families. So the heartache that comes from seeing, you know, these families in Tarangau prison where they've had separation from their children, um, long periods of, of, um, of no contact with children uh, and, and having a, a background, that's, that's really, if you, if you frame it as a, as a biopsychosocial issue of, of substance use, that has ended up as a criminal response, and they're in custody, and the and the decades that it takes to come back from that experience is is harmful. It's harmful. I I'm recalling practices where I've been supporting a young parent, and um, I've spoken to her about um, this forum before before today, and um, one of the things I really don't think I'll ever forget actually is is the is the um, child protection worker for her family slamming down urine screen um, pathology slips onto the table for that young person and it was this deliberate intimidating um, practice of just you know this just whack on the table one after the other five of them whack and 
it just, I mean, I look back at it and think that's got nothing to do with the substance use issues or the health. It's really just about sending this message to this person that, you know, we, we don't think you're okay as a parent. Um, really, so I was talking to Peter about this before too, about it's so arbitrary about what comes back on those, what's accepted on those urine screens as well. Like, you know, um, uh, I, I think it's encouraging that child protection are sort of seeing that, yeah, some levels of cannabis use um, are considered within the okay zone of good enough parenting. But what does that mean if it's just outside of that zone? You know, that's pretty arbitrary. And and when you, as as we all know, when you're doing a urine screen, it doesn't take into account anything about your parenting capacities and your capacities for love and care and protection and safety. Um, or it doesn't take into account anything that you might have done, which parents do do if they have substance use issues, uh, to minimise the impacts on children, whether that was the substance use was occurring outside of the family home or uh, other, other ways that, that people manage that. So I think there's a long way to go with that. One of the um, core things that VACRO put towards the recent um, parliamentary inquiry into the justice system is um, uh, asking for there to be an interface between child protection and the justice system so that they're able to coordinate much better the care of children where there is contact with the justice system. Um, and on a brighter note, <laughs> I think, yeah, just, just really supporting the workforce to be okay with this work, you know, looking at com common elements approaches, which is just really just stealing back from those um, branded family therapy um, modalities, all the good stuff, which is connecting with people, not using judgment, um, uh, being flexible and strength-based, uh, seeing problems in a relational way. Um, it's actually just as effective to use those common elements uh, between those, those proven um, modalities. You don't need to buy the program, the manual, and you don't need to get someone from the States to come over and supervise our workforce and to pay all this resource to have this program fidelity that may end, end, end up screening families out because they, they don't sign up to um, 12 sessions at the same time every week. Not, not every family is able to do that. Um, it's not right for every family. Um, and then finally, rethinking individualised AOD treatment entirely. So one of the things that happened to me was a bit of an existential crisis when Peter invited me to do this, uh, participate, uh, today in this discussion was I just I, I just almost couldn't think of anything helpful and useful out of <laughs> what's what current practice is in, in AOD. I just I just had this whole kind of like I don't even know if it works. Um, and I just I just had to come back in my thinking to um, some of those com common principles that just sound so familiar from from Trisha's story. They sound so familiar from the the family drug support research that, that families just want a listening ear and to take some of the shame out of out of this discussion. Am I about on time? Is that about? I think I'm yep. going to leave it there. Cool. If you were, we're looking at um, the mental health and AOD uh, working group the department's running, uh, looking at the recommendations out of the Royal Commission in terms of, you know, how services should be delivered. When I looked at the recommendations from the Royal Commission, I struggled to find much of a reference around family inclusive practice, I must admit. It's referenced but not really uh, acknowledged rather than talked about in any great depth. Why do you think there is such a reluctance to embrace, you sort of touched on it, but why is there such a reluctance to, to look at um, AOD issues particularly as a whole of family and whole of uh, relationship issue for people in terms of where the solutions can be found? 
why families always seen as the cause of the problem rather than part of the answer to the problem. That's probably the best way to say. Mm. Or do you think I've got it wrong? Which is I very think, possible. I think the answer is almost in your question. It's it's like to to sort of say that to approach treatment as as a whole of family approach. It doesn't it doesn't give any juice to this idea that it's the problems located in the individual. And the whole paradigm is that the problem is located in the individual. They're, they've made a bad choice. And, and, you know, you go to treatment to fix it. And that's just so wrong. It just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. Um, so I think without that attitude of, of um, as you say, spreading the load, like like spreading the load of that that issue, and that keeps us all accountable. That that means the wider community and wider society's attitudes towards substance use. We're just as accountable for for people going underground and and um, getting involved in in really risky behaviours, um, because that's how we've located the problem. So yeah, ouch. That's a bit bit of a big picture. Um, reason, but I, I, I'd speculate that's part of it. It's just it, it, it's a it's, it's just a very narrow focus of like it, it's you're, you're a widget. You, you got to <laughs> you got to seek treatment and make better choices and pull your socks up and and um, yeah, and and it's just for some reason that just seems like the easier way to frame the problem. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you. This has been a really great presentation. Um, I'm Kelly. I am the AOD family clinician at Uniting. So for me, it was really interesting hearing some of the feedback, especially from you, Horace and Peter, around um, gaps and around um, um, probably barriers as well for, for clinicians to be involved in care with families or what are some of those barriers. And one of the things um, at Uniting that's really great is that we've got a single session family work program that is, is being rolled out to almost every AOD clinician. So there is opportunity for clinicians to work with families in a more regular way rather than it just being left to the family worker. Um, and I think that that opens up, I suppose, more uh, opportunity for uh, increasing confidence around working with families and asking some of those questions that normally they wouldn't be asking families and maybe just focusing on their person. Um, I also just wanted to quickly um, say thank you to Trish. And one of the things that really landed for me with, with the things that you were saying, um, apart from some of those things I hear a lot around, um, you know, thank you for holding the space. And I just really needed this sort of you know, someone to talk to, to, to give this to, um, knowing that it would be held in a gentle way and in a non-judgmental way is, and, and this is really interesting for me, is the reflection you had around worrying about others who are also involved with your, your son, um, Josh. So the girlfriend, the statement about girlfriends and about friends, it was just really, I suppose that was just really interesting for me um, yeah, that was just sort of a reflection, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. It's great to have you here. I think I think you might be one of the very few <laughs> a handful of um, clinicians across the, the state that are doing very focused family work um, around young people, so that's fabulous to have you here. I only just heard about your role a few days ago, so that's really brilliant. And I totally agree with your observation about um, single session because it's it's a great way for to, to get past that barrier for for particularly the the youth workforce but perhaps other workforce as well where you don't need to you don't need to do family therapy to do single session family it's it's really just a, a wonderful framework of keeping things focused and keeping things safe um, but my only comment would be yeah once once it's trained um, it, that's where the work begins, not finishes. And so getting the workforce uh, with with a bit of mentoring around maybe double, doubling up and doing those sessions 
in pairs, I think, can be really powerful. And it also benefits the families. They actually really like that because they get this kind of uh, dual feedback towards the end when they, they do that summing up. Um, and I found that that's, that's really nice for families. One of the barriers I heard back from a similar discussion in, a, in, in another forum was um, a service provider said, oh, we don't invite families in. It just creates conflict. Like we always get this conflict and this shouting and it's like we, you know, and, and I, luckily I thought to myself, <laughs> um, not out loud, uh, in response was, yeah, I was thinking, well, isn't that the point? You know, isn't that the point that if, if that's what it's like when they're in a clinical space, imagine what it's like at home. Like it must be so distressing. Yeah. So, so in those single session family consults, I often um, advise other youth workers who are new to it to sort of stay plan for conflict, talk to, to talk to the family and say, hey, things could get heated. Like you might want a bit of a break. It's okay if you need to leave. Um, you're welcome back if you do. Um, and, and I find that young people, like, when they do leave, and they often do, they slam the door, you don't understand me, this is fucked, you know, I'm out of here. They leave. <laughs> There's a big story. But, you know, everyone's still talking about them and still still, still, still thinking about um, solutions together, and they want to be part of that. They don't want to come up, everyone to come up with a solution that they're not happy with, so they'll, they'll, they'll come back in yeah. invariably. And I think... Um, I think that's, yeah, thanks, Kelly. That's a really good point about that, that modality. Um, if I may, I um, <clears throat> might just offer a, a general reflection on after listening to Trish and listening to Horace as well as Kelly. Um, one of the things that's coming up a bit for me is like the focus on strengthening relationships and the connections that you have with people as the number one priority regardless of substance use and it's almost like everyone you know focuses and is a bit obsessed about the drugs you know what are they using how frequently is it da, 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 da. Um, and in many ways like perhaps you know a way forward um, is you know almost neglect you know, letting go of that walking away from that um, and considering people within their environment and um, talking about open dialogue and stuff um, sounds like such a fantastic um, model the other thing it reminds me of is something that was done in um child protection a little while ago uh i think it's family case conferencing um that was actually borrowed originally i think from new zealand um that was used particularly within um like a maori setting um to have a conversation with a community um, and i think you mentioned that before horace right about it being you know it takes a community it takes a village um, and that model um, really adopted and kind of worked with um, entire communities um, and people who wanted to be there around one person. Um, so it's just really interesting listening to um, different conversations in different sectors um, about how to improve and um, open dialogue and family case conferencing. Perhaps they're slightly different in modalities, except the main aim is the same, which is getting everyone in the room together. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to jump in with another question because I think this is a question that everyone wants to hear the answer to, and that is, Trish, what's the thing that stopped you giving up as a parent? Because it would be no one would blame some people from saying this is just too hard. What stopped you giving up, and what and what? Uh, and what nearly made you give up? Um, yeah, I won't lie. There were moments when I could happily have just um, walked away from it. Um, I, I loved him and I still love him. Um, I didn't like what the drugs did to him. I didn't like everything he was doing but I loved my son and I tried never to lose sight of that. I did, however, discipline him of my own. Oh, discipline's a funny word, but anyway, I he knew um, when he was doing things that were beneficial to him, I was there to um, 
help if he was doing things that weren't beneficial to him. I definitely didn't disappear, but I backed off. Um, I, I look. If I did walk away, it wouldn't. I wouldn't have lasted because I'd be wondering where is he and what is he doing. Um, I loved him. Um, yeah, I can't say it any more than that. I. It cost me. It cost me pretty close to most things. <laughs> um, yeah, but look. Looking back now, I've met, I've put it, I've put a spin on it. Like I've, I've, I look back at the journey now, and the main thing for me coming through court was that we, I didn't care about winning, losing, whatever. But I said we must still be a family at the other end of this, because that was what mattered to me. And it's the same as my son. Um, I just. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't in, it's not in me to give up. I got sick of it. Oh, don't worry about that. But I I couldn't give up. But to to give myself a break, I sometimes operated from a further back um, in my mind, like a step back. Um, yeah, but uh, what Horace said before, something that um, I thought of, he said when, when you're in a room full of clinicians and they're all sitting around you trying to figure out what to do and they're, you realise they're all paid and not one of them's there from, you know, from the love. <laughs> yeah, that's the one, what's what I want to say, that's the one thing that's missing in the room is love. Yeah. And that's why I always tried to be... Um, at most of those appointments in the beginning because he just felt like I could see he felt like the guinea pig and because no one really knew what to, knew what to do because there were so many different um, aspects of his problem. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but, no, my answer is I just, I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I couldn't, um, I couldn't back off. Mm. I love you. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks, Trish. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I, I just think the thing that I've liked about the uh, dialogue between the three speakers today and the audience, and it's really reflected just reading the chat, Trish, if, if we were having an election today, I think you'd be easily voted Prime Minister of Australia going on the chat room uh, ahead of uh, <laughs> Everybody, the people that are running, um, the, that are running publicly, is that um, it's that uh, human, the humanity of what you guys have talked about, yeah. and Horace sort of touched on it in some of the frameworks yeah. that he talked about. Yeah. But it seems to be the thing that's missing from our treatment, our treatment it is. modality. It is. Is, it, is that is that we don't talk about. You know, we talk about strengths and we talk about um, strength based systems and. But uh, the transformation, the transformational nature of life, is about human relationship that is deep in love and commitment. That is yeah. that, that, that doesn't see right or wrong, but just sees the person. Yeah. And and I and I think that's something that well, maybe we've lost sight of a bit in our mm. in our in our uh, in our organisational structural approach. Mm. But anyway, are there any are there any other comments from the chat room? I can't see any. What about you guys? You've you've been speaking to us for uh, the last couple of hours off and on. You've probably been a bit nervous, although it sounds like uh, some of you could talk underwater. Um, not talking about you, Trish, but um, mm. Chloe, from an FDS point of view, what what is what is the um, what is the biggest learnings out of the survey for you guys? What do you guys take away? I've read, I think it's a fantastic survey and I was really keen to, to get you guys on board to talk about it. But what, what's the thing that, you know, the big takeaway for FDS in terms of setting your strategic direction as an organisation from the survey? Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> that's another big question, Peter. And I think the main thing is that, um, like, I'm not sure if there's been a, a, 
survey that's really targeted family perspective, right? And that's really valuable in my mind because it is a form of advocacy in and of itself. I'm not sure if there is a great deal of advocacy. We've had a huge, huge conversation today about how there's not very much willingness in the community to make changes like this, to explore things like family dialogue, to take things further, to really embrace family inclusive practice. Um, so I think in terms of strategy, um, it's one of the most important things about the survey is continuing to um, keep it in people's um, you know, consciousness that um, we really need to be able to progress this situation and that means um, listening to, to people who know this situation the best. It's a valuing lived experience. It's valuing lived and living experience of family members. Um, yeah, um, there isn't a great deal of appetite for it and um, I think as an organisation that has a history of advocacy, that's something that FDS um, plans to continue to follow through on. Yeah. No, thanks, Chloe. Horace, as the, uh, as the family therapy expert on the panel, which isn't hard when you look at who we all are, you're, you're the guy with the qualms, right? Um, and you deal with women who are in prison for a whole range of things and who are separated from their children, which I just think so compounding all sorts of horrific things to put a, a parent in a jail and separate them from their little children. Like, God, <laughs> like, what? Is this the 21st century or what, right? Um, I, I well, live in Castlemaine, the yeah. Castlemaine jail um, uh, from, from convict era times. Um, the women in that, in that prison had all their children with them. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. yeah. So that's like hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the question is this: um, if we know that the the sort of approaches that you've been talking about are more effective for people, there's evidence that they're more effective. Mm. Mm. What is the reluctance to do it? Like, if it, if it works, why aren't we yeah. doing it? It's a bit similar to your last question. I'm not going to be very helpful. But, I mean, to back up what you're just saying, like the, the 2016 Youth Needs Service, uh, uh, Youth Needs, what was that, a survey? Um, that, that, that surveyed across the state a snapshot of a 1,000 young people. And when they rated what their most highest concerns were, was it homelessness? Was it like drug and alcohol? Was it mental health? Those were all there, but family relationships were their highest concern. Yep. That's people in drug treatment. And they're saying, my highest concern isn't drugs, <laughs> it's families. And the other side of that was exactly the opposite. So when they were asked, okay, but what do you recall about, you know, where you got help in the past, what was effective? They said the least help they got that they could they was around family uh, relationships. They looked back over the years. They saw uh, being out of school, being bullied, being, you know, like like trauma, all the all the things that happened. But they couldn't remember uh, who was who was helping them with with their family relationships. Yep. Um, so there's an endorsement from from young people to say we also want this too. We, we, we also want fam when it's safe, when it's okay to do that. Sometimes it's not safe. Um, but even then, isn't that family work? Isn't, isn't that family work when you're talking through a young person about how, um, yeah, they may not have a safe member in their family and how do yep. you manage that? So, look, Peter, I don't know. That's the short answer. I, I don't know what if we've got parents and families and caregivers saying yes we want to be part of the AOD service system. We have something to offer and we have support needs as well. You have young people and, and service users, as you like, consumers saying, yes, we need that as well. Um, yeah, what is the missing bit? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, policymakers, funders sort of really, really getting behind this as well. I hope, I hope this, this report sort of um, can be part of that. Thanks, Horace. Trish, Trish, are you still with us? 
Yeah. Yeah, so you've disappeared off the, we can't see you, but that's okay. Oh, I'm um, fine again. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. I, I just want to give you the last word before we close, Trish. Um, um, so, yeah. so, Trish, the, the question I have for you is mm-hmm. what do you want to say to us? Well, I, I just love today. I love listening. I think we're all on the one page and that, to me, it feels wonderful to hear that. Like I didn't feel alienated from any of one that spoke um, and that's, that's, I think that's a major step forward. <laughs> um, and like Horace, Horace's work um, and his, his approach and the way he thinks, um, I just wanted to, to, to say to Horace oh, and to everyone was, you know, the, the, the service providers that got through to my son and he was a hard egg to crack, I know, but um, were the ones that always, no matter what, they always greeted him warmly, but they had a humbleness about them um, because no matter how twisted and, and upset and, and um, confused the user is, they're not stupid and yeah. they can read authenticity t- at 10 paces. Um, yeah. And it was the, it was the honest warm approach with a bit of humbleness thrown in that got through the barrier. Um, yeah, and that, although that might sound a bit corny to some people, that if you want to get through to them and help them, you've got to get down to their level. Yep. Um, and it's nothing to do with the substance when you're talking to them. It's you've got to find them as a person. And the substance comes into the co- equation later on. You've got to discover the person if you okay. want to make make some ground. I, I know we're just oh, no, no. I, I see. The, I see the question. Yes, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's one question for you um, from uh, I think it's from Kelly. Is that right? I think it is from Kelly. Um, it's about self care, and it's um, how how did you care for yourself? While caring for your son, and and how did you find that? Um, uh, and did you find it hard to care for yourself for the in the beginning? Yes. And 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 who gave you permission to look after yourself? <laughs> because most people don't, do they? Well, well, no. Um, and I understand how that happens. Um, in the early days, I, I was the last person on the list of things to be helped. Um, and I could see myself, I could feel myself going downhill um, on a lot of levels. I was trying to make, I had a job um, in the small town and it was very hard because everyone knew what was happening. I worked in the main street Um and I went to the doctor one day and I said, look, this is getting really hard. And they, he put me on to a, someone, a counsellor, and the counsellor, you know, reiterated, what about you? And I thought, why does she keep saying, what about me? Like, you know, the problem is sitting at home in the bedroom. And, yeah, it took me until I could see myself going downhill um, that I realised that I had to start to look after me. Um, I actually ended up in hospital and it was through stress. Mm. Um, Yeah, so um, it became very apparent to me that, you know, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to manage if I didn't start to look after myself. And that did not mean not, not caring, but it made me put myself more to the, uh, to the front of what needed doing and it wasn't all about him um and funnily enough he wanted me to look after myself um so you know a lot of people say they're selfish and yes they can be selfish but he used to say I want you to be all right mum um but then on the same token he could be monstrous but that you know that's another story but that's the drug um but, yeah, I did not look after myself in the beginning. I was just Mrs Fix-It and I, I realised after a while I couldn't fix him. Um, yeah. 
So it did take a hell of a shock and ending up in hospital from stress to turn that around and give my, and it was me, myself, that gave me permission to, to look after myself. Mm. And then FDS reiterated that when I met them and I can't speak highly enough of um, the guidance that they've given me and I've seen it help others tenfold but I can't speak highly enough of what they've done. Mm. Uh, Thanks, Trish. Look, on that note, I'm going to thank everybody for their attendance today, both those in the audience and uh, and those that presented. Um, so we want to thank you all for uh, being so forthright and open with your sharing today. And we want to acknowledge uh, just the journeys you've been on and the wisdom and kindness that you've shared with us today. And for those that are in the audience, if there's anyone who's been really uh, troubled or disturbed by what's been said, Please use family drug support and other counselling services. I know that um, this can be really traumatic, and we we don't want to we don't want this to be a a negative thing for people hearing this today. We want people to be looked after and and uh, well and truly catered for. So on that note, I'd just like to say goodbye and thank you. I'd like uh, I'd like Chloe and Horace, Trish and Nick to just stay online if that's okay for five minutes to touch base. But we'll uh, we'll just thank you all and wish you uh, a very good day. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>